They mm -hmm. saw the change and they mm -hmm. trusted, this place trusted me, mm -hmm. where the other place had no room. And the name, tell us the name of that place again, the, 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 the one that trusted you, which, what's it's, the It was the rehab center, it was called Dodds Hall, D-O-D-D, -D, in Ohio State University. It was a new center and mm -hmm. very exciting. I'm not sure that it is today, all the people are gone, it could be still. Mm -hmm. But it was just an incredible, people with vision had started that center. And then I said, there, there, no one, this was 1963. Well, you know, just to recapitulate something that you've been saying all along, it's the gift is in what's not perfect. The teaching, you know, whether it's the life, uh, the life impact that's not perfect, or working with a situation that is highly imperfect, that the door opens. I mean, so this is kind of a theme that you've been pointing to all along. So it, it makes sense, you know, and particularly in severe um, compromise that that is the greatest gift and that is the teacher. So it's very, you know, we can kind of see how that whole entryway and, and, and Hawkins um, influence as well. Mm -hmm. So I was just using the principle of effortlessness right. with these women. Exactly. Then I moved to New York and um, studied with Eric and also worked at a place called, um, it's not, not there anymore, it was on Welfare Island, which I think now has probably high rises, but a wonderful mm -hmm. island in the middle of Manhattan. But I'm saying wonderful, but it was, there was Goldwater Hospital and mm -hmm. Verdes Kohler Hospital, and they had like 2,000 people that had just been, you know, put off. Uh, so I was, I worked there for two years. And there's a lot of stories I could keep, but I'm wanting to let go of some of them. So then I went to Europe, I did some Anyway, there was more there. At the Psychiatric Research Center, I ended up working, and I didn't speak the language very well, so I developed a lot of hands-on mm. work there. And then I was in England. I studied with the Dr. and Mrs. Bobeth. That's a whole other period. Then I came back, and I met Len, and five months later married him and went off to Japan. Where did you meet Len? Studying Aikido. Uh-huh. And then in Japan, I got a job as an occupational therapist teaching, well, helping to establish a school for occupational physical therapists. And I did all of the occupational therapy teaching in regards to physical disabilities. When I came back to How New York... How long were you there? Two and a half years. Wow. I and had did my you, first excuse son me, there. Did you learn to speak Japanese? Some, but oh. I didn't study. I mean, I, I studied on my own. Mm -hmm. These are all other stories, but I'm going to skip them because there's a thing. And then I came back to New York Meanwhile, before I went to Japan, one of my very old dance friends said to me, because I was already working with people and teaching dance, I was doing a lot of things, but I was teaching. I uh, taught with, at the Hawkins School, but I also taught on my own. But you, you, you had the child at that time? In Japan, I had my first child. And that, uh, their name? Joshu was born in Joshu. Japan. Mm -hmm. But when I came, but before I went to Japan, someone asked me, should they study anatomy? And I said, no, it's not necessary. And she said, that's easy for you to say because you already know it. Because I was working in spirals there. I was doing all the spiralic stuff. Okay, came back from Japan, and that's when I started the school. So it was kind of like, I didn't want to work in hospitals anymore. And I already had a reputation in New York. And people came to me. I mean, I, within a year I couldn't take students and that's when I started the training because mm. I was already. Mm. And meanwhile I had my second, my daughter was born there and then Len went to chiropractic school when he finished. The AMA, the American Medical Association, had so repressed chiropractic in New York that you could only work in, as a chiropractor if you graduated from Chicago and I think some other school. Mm. He was the last program in New York City to not be able to practice in New York City, so we moved to Massachusetts, a school there. Oh my right goodness, oh, that's how you got there. But I want to I just rewind for a second. I mean, you have this huge career, 
you know, there's teaching and you know, trainings and this and that, and you're in a marriage, and you have now two children. Well, I had a third one in Massachusetts. Okay, I so was pregnant when I left New York. How do you, okay, so <laughs> how does that work exactly? Um, I mean, in other words... You have to be insane, actually. Okay, we want to establish that. <laughs> I mean, because, and how old were you during these periods of... Uh, we just so want to she see. was born when I was 30. Oh, okay, so you weren't a kid. No. I mean, 30 is, you know... I was considered an older woman giving birth at 30. Yeah, you would be. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, how do you... I mean, did you have uh, domestic help? Or, I mean, you, so you did, uh, you know, the whole thing? And the cooking and everything? Well, Len and I shared it. I mean, we've, we've shared our life together. But that's an awful lot. Yes, it is. I mean, three kids in itself, and then running this huge visionary school training. At 85, he gave up his chiropractic practice to join me because I couldn't do it all, mm -hmm. and he became the administrator. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how. You know, when uh, you look... When, I mean, did you ever when sleep? Went, did you sleep at all? I used to sleep uh, until, very similar to you, I would get up at 2 in the morning and I would be awake until 5 and then go back for a mm -hmm. couple of hours. Um, I don't do that anymore. But that's when I would do my writing. Mm -hmm. Because I always, you know, I've written thousands of pages. I mean, that in itself is just... So the, the uh, unfolding of the school and the intricacy. Okay, I want to get to the kinesthetic capability. When you talk about different systems, vestibular system and all of the various systems, you're talking from a kinesthetic point of view from mm -hmm. how I would see it. So how do you, is there a way that you can, how, how did you get there? Okay. Um, I started studying with Andre Bernard, who studied with Barbara Clark, who studied with Mabel Ellsworth Todd, so mm -hmm. that tradition. And I started in 65. That's I, when I went to New York to study with Eric, was 65. Mm -hmm. And um, he, Andre was incredible, uh, Andy. Anyway, he gave me a, he, he handed me a human pelvis, and he had me hold it, the sits bones here. And now he said, now feel your own. Mm. Uh -huh. So that was incredible. And then eventually I went through all the bones and I went through all the muscles. Like I spent s teaching f four or five classes a week on the feet for six months. This was in New York, the beginning of the school. Just deciphering and w anyway, it, and then it would take me about two years. Once I did that, then I started exploring, because I knew what I was seeing wasn't what I was talking about. And then I was also doing the developmental work that I had learned with the bow baths. And she had said, even if you never work with children with cerebral palsy, which is what I was studying, and it's just a knee problem, look for the developmental process underneath it. So when I first started teaching development, I was doing all this with dancers. I, there's so many stories and they're kind of mixing up together, but when I came back from Europe, before I met Len or around the time I met Len, uh, I was offered many jobs, but they were all with in hospitals where they were cutting up their kids and putting them in braces, and I knew that I would, I would not be able to tolerate it. So I decided I had to apply it with dancers only. Before I was working with the dancers and I was working in hospital and I was doing home visits. I had a lot of energy, studying six hours of dance a day. I, mean, I had a lot of energy. Um, so I just, that's when I started this, no, that was later I started this. School. Anyway, let me pause for a second. I also study with Ermgard Bartiniev, mm. and um, off and on for like 19 years. I've had wonderful teachers. And one day she had me doing something, I'm not sure exactly what it was, let's say I was on my hands and knees, and she was saying something about pulling back with the hamstrings. 
Now today, people, a lot of people would know what that was talking about. She even yelled at me. I didn't have a clue what she was talking about. To me, muscles contracted like this. I didn't know, I didn't have a concept of the moving through. And so that was another clue. I'm just saying that because that's a clue when I went to muscles. Well, how do they, what happens if it pulls this way? What if it happens if it pulls that way? I knew where I was. So then I had also met a man, Yogi Ramira, back in 1967. And he was a physical therapist. He had come from outside of Madras, India. He came to the hospital, Burdess Kohler, and, and a lunch break gave a little rap on yoga, which who knew about yoga in the early 60s. And I had lived with Indians and in, 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 at the university. I had very good Indian friends. So I, I was interested in him as an Indian, not so much in yoga, but okay. Yoga was very boring because it was positional and wasn't something I was particularly interested in. And I could do every, all the postures. But he was looking for a place to give classes. So I was being a good hostess, American hostess, and I said, well, you can use my apartment. I thought I was offering something. I didn't realize he was setting me on a path. This is how life happens. So it was the first ashram in America from his lineage was in my apartment. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What I noticed in doing the yoga, I couldn't wait for him to find another one, by the way, because it took my time, was that I could do all the postures easily. But I did have more energy. And eventually, he did find another place. And I was very happy. But I kept remembering, and there was a routine. I don't remember the routine. It gave me energy. And so through the years, if I was low on energy, I would go back to this. And so he talked about people that they were able to uh, see in this clinic in India who had um, diabetes and they would heal it and they could even have sugar or whatever. They would totally heal. So it kept, that interested me. So after I'd spent several years with bones and muscles and I, I knew it wasn't what I was seeing. I, I was seeing something deeper, I thought, okay, organs. So then I went into the organs and the glands. And then when after I did that, I thought, well, the nerves and the fluids. Each new system would take me about two years. The big one was how to decipher the fluids because there was no location. And the first fluids that I would differentiate was the blood and CSF. And then it went on to subcellular, cellular, etc. But it was a pathway that I think is not, that I think and feel that we are also have teachers in many realms of existence, whatever that means, mm -hmm. that it comes to us. It's not something we make happen. And somehow this body is a conduit for some information to be actualized at this time. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I mean, and I don't actually care because if I'm just present, that's enough. And ready to be fully alive and ready to die at any moment. And everything will be revealed as is needed in the moment. So it can have many spins, and people can spin it, however. Mine is just to be as actively present for whatever is up. <laughs>